Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 30, Experience-Based Education, with our guest, Isaac Morehouse, CEO of DiscoverPraxis.com. Praxis is a one-year program where you learn by doing. Students are placed at a small company where they work alongside entrepreneurs every day. Instead of studying to pass a test, you learn real-world business building experiences, which includes one-on-one coaching, self-guided projects, hard and soft skills training, and much more. This was one of my favorite interviews that I've done so far at Liberty Entrepreneurs because learning from entrepreneurs and having this mentorship mentality, I think, is the best way to be successful. Please follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. As always, show notes are found on our website. Enjoy the show. On the show with me today is Isaac Morehouse, CEO of discoverpraxis.com, which is an alternative education for students to get real world education experience in a mentorship program, which they say will change your life in one year. Classes are available every single month. Isaac, thank you so much for coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs. Hey, thanks, Ash. I appreciate having me on. This the the topic, the theme of this show is really kind of the theme of my life. So it's exciting to be here. Yeah, well, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I really got interested in the ideas of liberty probably in my mid to late teens. I I was always interested in, you know, sort of vaguely, generically helping the world, making the world a better place sort of stuff. And, um, you know, I'd done some humanitarian type, uh, you know, missions work in the summers and things like that. And, And, you know, realized pretty quickly that there's something so much more fundamental that keeps people from achieving whatever they want in life from from health, wealth, prosperity, personal fulfillment. And it's so much more fundamental than just, you know, here, here's some resources. Um, it was the political institutions that people live under. And so that kind of led me to look into political philosophy and economics a little bit. And I think the first the first book that started it off, my brother actually recommended it to me, was uh, Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman. And I already was kind of vaguely predisposed to, you know, free markets, I guess, from what little I knew. But that book really blew my socks off. And I thought, wow, this is this is amazing. This is awesome. And so I really dove into, you know, economics, really, especially public choice theory, Austrian economics and uh, political philosophy and became, you know, more or less just a, a libertarian and passionate about making the world a freer place. So like many people, the first thing I thought of when I thought, how do I make the world a freer place was, oh, politics, right? Mm, Sure, (laughs) uh, yeah. Which uh, you can save yourself a lot of pain if you just trust me and don't just trust me. Go go, go study public choice theory as well. Yeah, and and follow a candidate that isn't in the mainstream. Follow a a Ron Paul or a a Gary Johnson or you'll start losing faith in the political system. (laughs) Oh, I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. It's 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 destined. It's set up. It's structured so that only the very types of things that someone who loves liberty wouldn't want are the things that are rewarded. There's actually a great chapter in The Road to Serfdom uh, by Hayek, chapter 10, Why the Worst Get on Top. Um, I encourage you to, to go read that. You can Google it and find just that chapter. Uh, it's really, really good stuff. But so I actually worked in the state legislature in Michigan and realized pretty quickly, this is this is a mess. These, these people are not leaders, they're followers. They're going to go where it's safe to go based on bigger changes that have already happened in society and the beliefs of the public. And so then I went and worked in kind of policy think tank world and then sort of educational, um, you know, the education space in the liberty movement, if you will, uh, the Institute for Humane Studies, great organization doing, you know, summer seminars and programs for for young people who are interested in these ideas and might want to become uh, intellectuals, professors, advocates for the ideas of liberty. And, and all of this was based on this understanding that I had that I had come to that it's not politicians that determine the kind of world we live in, it's beliefs. It's the beliefs people have are the ultimate binding constraint on what politicians can get away with. I mean, there's there's a reason that politicians can't uh, take away all of your guns in the United States today. 
that reason is the beliefs of the public. It's not because they don't want to or because they couldn't pass a law or whatever else. And there's a reason that someday maybe they will be able to because those beliefs can change. So I wanted to, to change people's beliefs through education. All well and good so far. Uh, are you with me, Ash? Oh, we're, oh, we're, we're here. I'm, I'm loving Okay. Sounds great, right? But then I realized something. Um, I realized I was dramatically overestimating the role that ideas and arguments play in changing people's beliefs and dramatically underestimating the role of experiences. Mm. And there's only so many people that you can convince through logic or even good marketing and appeal to emotions through argument, through ideas directly that, let's say, uh, the taxi cab cartel is economically inefficient and or immoral. Right. There's a small percentage of the population that will be like, oh, you won me over. Right. You're right. You, I no longer you, believe you have that's all good. The, you have all the facts. Your logic is very sound. And I agree with your conclusions now. Yes, these are now my conclusions. That, yeah, that happens right. very rarely. And, and that's and that's powerful. And I think that's important because the, the people who are convinced through argument, they do tend to be disproportionately influential to the broader public. Um, mm -hmm. They tend to be the sort of intellectual leaders in some way. So I think those ideas are an important component of changing beliefs. But that's a very small sort of remnant of people who um, are going to be reached that way. The majority of people, their beliefs are shaped primarily by experiences. So back to the taxi example, which is, I'm sure on this show you've talked about more than your fair share and it's overused, the whole Uber thing, but it's but it's powerful and everyone knows it. So it's, it's used for a reason. Contrast that argument that the think tanks and policy writers and, and intellectuals for decades explaining why taxi cartels are stupid. Contrast that to Uber. Right. They don't try to argue with anyone. There's nothing ideological overtly about Uber. It's like here, we built an alternative experience. Mm -hmm. And once you've tasted it, once you've tried it, your beliefs about taxi cartels change. Now you're pissed off when the governor's trying to enforce it and ban Uber. Now you're all of a sudden an advocate for more liberty, not because you read John Locke, but because you rode in an Uber, you experienced it. And so that kind of opened me up. And Bitcoin is the same way. It's like, and the Fed posters are not a threat to, you know, the, the Federal Fed. Reserve. They don't yeah, care how many marches you plan on Washington, yes. D.C. Yes. And you, you can tell by by what is the status quo fear, right? The status quo doesn't fear you running for school board or showing up at the, the town hall meeting. They fear you pulling your kid out of school and homeschooling them or starting an alternative school, right? They fear alternatives. Because it's the same reason the Soviet Union banned not only free market textbooks, but Marlboro cigarettes and blue jeans right. and jazz music. Because once you experience mm -hmm. something free, you no longer are willing to tolerate the crap that the state puts out. So this is this massive epiphany for me. And I thought one of my pet peeves for, for ever since I was an undergrad 15 years ago is higher ed. Like this is such an inefficient, wasteful, cartelized system with all these subsidies, artificially cheap loan money. You're, you're learning nothing in the classroom almost always. It's the whole thing just felt like a mess. And I was tired of arguing and just trying to convince people, oh, higher ed is inefficient. It could be better. Right. And it's inefficient because it's this and because it's expensive and because, you know, we don't have enough classes or the textbooks are too much or we can't get our hands on them or certain people get treated differently and we're not all the same. And yeah, higher education is a racket, just like public school is a racket. And, yeah. and, and what you've done is you've taken the, the education model and applied an experience model to it. Is that right? Absolutely. The, the idea was like, I'm, I, I don't want to argue with people about higher ed because most of the time, people will just agree. They'll say, yeah, it is terrible. And then go on supporting it because they don't know of any alternative. So I was like, if I'm right, if my theory is right about the inefficiency of higher ed, this is a massive market opportunity. Mm -hmm. I need to know if I'm right. I need to test this out. And I've got to test it out with the best feedback mechanism known to man, the profit and loss model. Sure. I've got to put it out on the market. And if I can create value, I will succeed. If what I believe, if I believe what I believe about better ways to achieve what college is attempting to achieve, then I will benefit from that. So I'm going to build it. I'm going to yeah. stop arguing with people. I'm going to build an alternative to undermine what I see as a, as a stagnant system. And the, 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 final sort of element that's exciting for me is that what I'm building is not only an alternative to college, it's also 
the the model of Praxis itself, the way the program is run, is learning by doing, learning through experience, and helping people learn to themselves be entrepreneurial in the way they approach life. You criticize by creating. Right. And, and what does Praxis actually mean? Does is this derived from praxeology? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a little tip of the hat to uh, to old Ludwig von Mises. Um, but it it also the, the meaning of the word is basically the combination of theory and practice. It's to learn theory by trying it and to um, and to try things, you know, to, to test out your theories in the real world. So it's it's that combination of theory and practice, really learning by doing. Uh, that's what the word praxis actually means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can remember. I'm not sure if you're familiar. I'm sure you are. But uh, Prax Girl from way back in the day, the, the, the girl and her, her teammate, I can't remember his name, but they released maybe 20 or 30 Praxeology videos. Um, do, no I think, way. I'm actually not familiar with that. What? Really? No. I'm wow. going to have to go check it out. Yeah, you've got to check out Prax Girl. She does an amazing job. She starts from very basics and uh, starts talking about, you know, at its very essence, human action is purposeful. And, you know, let's look at why it's purposeful and let's why humans act in a certain way. And what can we learn from the methodology of understanding that all human action is purposeful and there is no independently illogical action? Yeah, yes. it's, you, you definitely want to reach out for her for oh, your I, I would love show. to. Yeah. Coming back to saying like, hey, you thought that you had this idea about education has a lot of opportunity to grow because we're stuck in this mundane type of system that was designed back in the day that pe kids sit in rows and classes and look at a overhead or a chalkboard. And you wanted to put out this idea of practice education, but instead of trying to convince people of it, you want to put it out in the marketplace because if you were profitable, then that's that's really the only thing that you need to take away to see if you're successful or not. The profit in the marketplace is a beautiful feedback mechanism, and it doesn't really require you to sit in a chair and start debating people about, you know, hmm. who could build the roads or who could build the schools. It's, no, I, Isaac, am building the schools, and here's what I'm doing, and here's what all of my clients say, and I'm profitable, so I know that there's demand for this. Oh, absolutely. I, I love the mantra – you know, innovate around oppression or, mm. or criticize by creating. Just if you want a better, freer world, go get busy building the kind of world you want to live in right. instead of talking about it. And it's there's just something so freeing about it. I mean, the moment that I decided to do this, and again, we're young, we're only two years in, uh, I have massive dreams for this and I have yet to see uh, whether we can get to the point that I want to get to. I'm confident we can, but it's an open question. But when I decided to do this, all of a sudden I was so captivated by getting an answer to my question. My question was, can it be done the way that I imagined? Can, is this much more valuable like I think it is? Can I create value for people? And suddenly I didn't even care. I didn't worry about failure. I just had to know the answer. And even if the answer came back as no, you can't create value for people. That's why you're not making any money, whatever. I would rather try it and get that answer than to not know. So it's, I, I call entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship is philosophy. Instead of thought experiments, it uses field experiments. Mm. It's philosophy in, in action, applied philosophy. Right. Um, and, that, and that really excites me. Yeah, I love that. You know, for a while now, I've thought that either you learn from philosophy or you learn from experience. And a lot of the times, if you don't learn from philosophy, that experience tends to turn to suffering. And then you can learn from that suffering and hopefully learn a lot of good lessons so that you don't have to suffer in the same way. But mm -hmm. if you can learn from philosophy, then that is that is the ideal way of learning and then putting it into action like you're doing right now. Isaac, what types of programs do you offer in practice? Let's assume that I am someone, I'm a college student and I not really that interested in college. I see it as a racket and it's expensive and I, all my friends are just going out and partying and, and this, I want to learn. I actually want to learn because I understand that I have to pave my own way. What types of programs could I look to Praxis, discoverpraxis.com to educate myself? Yeah, it's really straightforward. It is a one year apprenticeship program. So it's a one year apprenticeship with a startup uh, or growing small business, depending on how you define startup, but they tend to be sort of startup type environment where you're apprenticing. At the same time, you are getting a rigorous personal and professional development 
curriculum that includes, you know, weekly coaching sessions. You're going through, we've got a, a curriculum library of different modules, everything from philosophy, history, economics to business, digital skills, um, you know, really sort of applied stuff. And you're kind of crafting a self guided curriculum, a series of challenges for yourself building a personal brand website, you know, blogging, creating projects to, to put in a portfolio of skills you've completed, along with your Praxis advisor, getting that coaching, that accountability to really push you to not just go have this great apprenticeship experience, but at the same time to become a self-directed learner and someone who knows how to sort of see yourself as a startup, me Inc, right? You are your own company, your own brand, and you need to sort of take charge. What's your value proposition? How can you increase the value you bring to others? How can you signal that to the marketplace, to the world and really building, um, building your own brand and your own set of experiences while you're, while you're getting this, this phenomenal apprenticeship experience. And, and one of the best things about it real quick, I, I'll, I won't keep going on, but is the, the type of apprenticeships people are getting through Praxis, our business partner network, they tend to be five to 50 person companies where the founder is still actively involved. They're in growth mode. So you don't, it's not a place where you're sitting there in a cubicle farm with like 15 other interns making coffee. There are companies where you've got to be creating value. You're shadowing the founder and CEO. You're seeing what all aspects of running the business are like. Yeah, no, that's, that's great because, you know, the transition from startup mode to a growth mode is, is very important. And I think there's a lot of lessons that people can learn from that stage is, you know, during the startup phase, you're looking for systems. You're trying to see where your failures are. You know, once you start migrating to the growth phase, you've started to get some market feedback. Maybe you've started to have your first couple of clients and you're starting to really figure out what your value proposition in the marketplace is. This is an excellent place for anyone to have an opportunity to get the visibility of, okay, let me see, you know, what does it mean to start a business? Well, I came into this thing and we're still a small business of 20 or 30 people, but what type of processes and systems have they already put in place that are supporting the growth phase right now? I've seen so many people that haven't concentrated on the startup phase and like really building a foundation of, of systems that they can depend on that are going to work for them. And they instantly want to start marketing, go into the growth phase, and then they can't handle it. So I think that that's a, a really prime area for your students to to start in is like hey you don't have to build it from scratch because that's extremely difficult and that's where most people fail but now you're in the growth phase where you're going to get a lot of experience because of what we've already done and we can teach you about that but also what does it mean to continue to build a successful business yeah absolutely absolutely getting getting that exposure i mean you learn you learn by doing and being around if you're interested in being an entrepreneur or maybe you just don't know being around an entrepreneur is really the best way. You, you, it's one of those things you just, you can learn some things by studying and you can, you can get a little bit, but you can't learn how to ride a bike by reading about it. Maybe right. you can learn about why a helmet's important and that's nice, but you've got to try it. And entrepreneurship is like that. You've just got to be exposed to it. Yep. I just had this conversation the other day how somebody asked me, how can I possibly expect change or to affect change in the world if I'm not voting? And I asked them, are you familiar with what an entrepreneur does? Do you realize that an entrepreneur is looking out in society, trying to find problems like you did? You found a problem in education and then you're trying to transpose the current system, try to offer different opportunities for people to choose from. Like you said, as soon as they have that experience of choosing a different option, an option that they may not even know exists then they're going to find that freedom. They're going to taste that freedom and they're going to start slowly getting the idea. And that's the purpose of Liberty Entrepreneurs is trying to help our friends that are still big L libertarians or <laughs> people that are still stuck into, you know, well, Donald Trump's not the best, but he sure is better than Bernie Sanders or people like this, right? It's like, how has that actually changed anything? Why don't you go build something and offer something to your fellow man or woman to give them more options in the marketplace to satisfy their own needs and desires and wants? I constantly think about this, and that's why I was so excited to interview you. I constantly think about what if education was based on mentorship and internships instead mm -hmm. of like book, desk, repetition, test taking. What type of world would you see us in if, if education was based off of doing instead of just like studying and regurgitating? Oh, man. I mean, it's it's 
uh, you know, not to sound too utopian, but I, I can barely, I can barely comprehend how awesome I imagine the world being if, if young people from, from day one, if their education came from play and experimentation and shadowing and mentoring and apprenticing and engaging with the world in whatever way was you know interesting to them and letting their intrinsic motivation drive the kind of challenges that they face. I can't even imagine. I mean, I just think the diversity of products, ideas, ways of doing things would be absolutely off the charts and the and the kind of contentment and fulfillment. I, I see the current education system, I call it the conveyor belt, <laughs> where there's no there's no self the inertia does not come from the individual. It, it's an external system. And as long as you basically obey the rules, you're moved along automatically, essentially just based on your age. I mean, you have to really be like pretty you have to really go far to to sort of not make it to the next stage, to, to not be handed a diploma or whatever else. And you get plopped off at the end of it, and it's like, okay. For, for 20 plus years, you've been sheltered from the real world entirely and taught by people who almost like have chosen to avoid the real marketplace because they hate it and they're scared of it disproportionately, <laughs> teachers, professors. And all of a sudden you're dropped off in the real world and said, good luck, go succeed. You know, to, to go back to the bike riding example, it'd be like passing a law that says kids are not allowed to touch a bike for 20 years and they got to take classes about the history of rubber and the tires and the bike construction and draw pictures of bikes and be taught by people who hate bikes and have never ridden them. And then all of a sudden at the end of this 20 years, they're dropped off in the middle of the highway with a bike and say, okay, go ride. Good luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? They're out there having to compete in some, you know, 200 mile bike ride all of a sudden. Right. Which is why, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not at all like, oh, you know, the, the solution to the world's problems is to throw more money at, you know, get, forgive student loans or whatever. But I, but I empathize with students who are pissed off that they've got all this debt and a degree and 62% of people with degrees are either not working or working jobs that don't require a degree. And they're yeah. carrying an average of 34 K in debt or whatever it is. And they're, they're angry because their whole life guidance counselors and everyone has told them, just obey the rules, sit down, shut up, turn in assignments on time, get the best grades, get to the best school, just stay on the conveyor belt. It will give you a job right. that the, the, this is tried and true. This is proven. This is what works yes. for everyone. And it's like that, that type of mentality doesn't take into effect the, the evolution of the marketplace itself. Like just keep doing it. And this is a very governmental type of idea. You know, just yes. keep, keep doing this. Don't don't deviate from what our plan is. This had worked one time or two times in the past. So we're, we just know it's going to continue to work and forget about all this new type of education or potential ways of learning, you know, and just just stick with what we say. It's a very top down type of bossy mentality and parents, too. We can't leave I'm, parents out of it, this. It's the Soviet idea. It's the, it's the planning idea. If you just create the right rules and follow the rules, the outcome should just sort of be guaranteed. But the market is a dynamic process. It's a discovery procedure that relies on this dynamic give and take and entrepreneurship. And I think I, I'm not one of these people who says once upon a time, this was a good education system. I actually don't think it ever was. I think for a long time, it was easy to think it was because there were correlations, not causations, but correlations that were stronger than they are today between educational attainment and things like income, whatever. But what has always been true, what the market cares about is value creation. That's right. What the education system cares about is following the rules. Now, right. there are times when following the rules can create value. It all just depends. But but that's not the fundamental cause of earnings of prosperity. And so in, in an education system, you come to believe that the fundamental cause is winning in the zero sum system by following the rules better than everyone else. Right. In the marketplace, with the exception of government jobs and bureaucracies, which are value destroying anyway, that's not true. Value creation is all that matters. And you've got value creation and then your ability to convince people you can create value. Because that's what sales is. That's what getting hired is. It's, it's saying, I can create value. I need to convince you that I can so that you give me the chance to do it. And then you've got to back it up. But so the degree is really a signal that says, I can create value. And that's well, it's, supposed, signal, it's supposed to be, isn't it? But yes, see, and it's, uh, it's unfortunately it's now backwards. it's yeah, unfortunately now it's a degree means I can follow rules. Yes, yes. Instead and there, of and I there are a decreasing number of jobs where that matters. So I completely agree with you, Isaac, that the diploma is starting to lose a lot of its value because it no longer really signifies 
what you can bring to the marketplace, the value that you yourself have. But instead, like we said, that you can sit in a classroom, you can make your classes and you can take tests and follow directions and and learn what the professor wants you to learn and regurgitate that when the time comes, just like high school and probably flush it out afterwards. I know that there was there's countless types of circuitry information and you know how to how to find electricity around all the nodes in a circuit that I learned that I didn't think I was ever going to learn. I mean, isn't that something common for especially high school kids to say is, when am I ever going to use this in the real world? For me, whenever I, I've hired a lot of people um, in my life and I have never once asked somebody if they graduated from college. I've never once asked to see somebody's diploma. Instead, I asked them, what are you passionate about? Why do you think you're going to be good for this position? You know, what keeps you motivated? What happens whenever you fail? Like, are, are you able to have failure? Do you think that you're always right? Trying to evaluate someone's skill set, but also their mentality and how they hold themselves. Are they uh, ask questions first to me whenever they have a problem? Or are they uh, ask questions first to Google whenever they have a problem? Uh, how much experience do they have building a system? What importance, if any, does logic and philosophy have in their life? And trying to make a personal connection with someone before they join my team rather than, do you have a degree? You do? Come on in. Oh, it's it's amazing. I mean, even something as simple as, what podcasts are you listening to? Sure. If they're listening to four or five great podcasts right now. That tells me so much more than that they got a bunch of good grades in a class. Um, you know, it shows that they're interested in learning and they're taking advantage of opportunities. You know, we were talking about politics. It kind of reminds me of, you know, everyone has this illusion early on that politicians are people who are good at policy. No, not at all. Politicians are people who are good at elections. Graduates are people who are good at tests, not necessarily people who know how to do things. They may be, but it's not a direct correlation. And, and that signal can even be a negative signal. I talked to a business owner recently who said, yeah, this guy was pretty good, but he had a fancy degree from an Ivy League school so I just didn't want to hire him because I just felt like he was over-credentialed for the role. And the guy really wanted the role, but right. <laughs> but it was like, eh, you know. Um, it's like, it's, so, like be, it's like being too smart to join the police force. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, if you have that, you're probably going to be, you know, you're going to face all kind of parental pressure. You're going to have a certain kind of attitude. I, I want someone who just wants to come in and create value. Um and, and a final a final thought experiment on this for young people who are listening. We, we, we tell our Praxis participants this. I say, give me a resume that you're not allowed to list your educational attainment or uh, job titles from previous jobs. Mm. So in other words, no static labels and right. titles and accolades, but demonstrate to me what kind of value you can create and give me some sort of proof of a time when you did it. I'd much rather see instead of server at Applebee's, I'd much rather see for the six months between, you know, September and whatever, I generated 25% more tips than the average server. Oh, okay. And, Here's and, some value you've created. Right. right? And, I, and I had 25 less complaints. And, yes, you know, exactly. I, I got a lot of customer service experience and I learned how to diffuse situations where the customer was irate. And yep. I, I understood how to handle those situations and maybe I, I comp them a free beer or maybe I give them a free salad bar. But yeah, I completely agree with you. The experience, if, if this entire podcast could be wrapped into one thing, Isaac, it's that the experience matters most. Less talk, more action. Absolutely. A lot less talk and a lot more action. Oh, and it's amazing, Ash, the number of, I mean, there's so many times where I wish I was 16, 17, 18, 20 again, because- the number of opportunities we have our business partners coming to us all the time. Hey, um, uh, choose yourself media, James Altucher. If you've ever heard of him, sure. um, he's a great author, podcaster, his media company that publishes all of his books and everything small, you know, a handful of employees. They're like, we want some young person to help us ramp up our content marketing and our digital marketing strategies and whatever. And they don't want a degree. They want someone who can work hard. This opportunity to go work, with someone like James Altucher for a year, or you know, we've got CEOs of growing companies who are like, I want someone as my company grows to just shadow me and help me build my personal brand so I can be more visible, make a you know website and a blog and help me with that stuff. And it doesn't even require like some high level of skill. I mean, the number of of people just looking, they're hungry and eager for talent. 
to come and help them and just be creative problem solvers and work hard. It's astronomical. And spending one year at a place like that will get you so much further than spending four years in six figures in school. Yeah, it's going to be cheaper. It's going to set you up for life a lot better. I feel that with Discover Praxis, your company, you're actually helping people find what they're passionate about and what they enjoy doing. You know, we're always told growing up like, oh, find a job that you love to do. And then it's like you're not working. But then we sit through 20 years of in indoctrination education and all we do is learn how to take orders and so we get out and we we hate what we're doing a lot of the time and so we don't even know like as a as a discovery people say well I, I gotta go to college to find myself i mean that's the most inefficient way to discover and expensive I can imagine. so expensive I, people say well I'm, I'm interested in marketing oh yeah uh what do you want like about marketing well, I had a marketing class that I liked. Right. Well, like you have no idea. Marketing can be, you can be a data cruncher, a numbers guy in marketing. You can be a design person. You can be, there's so many different things. I say it's too stressful. This is, this is my take on the do what you love thing. It's too stressful when you're young to try to figure out what you love and go like pick the one thing instead. And, and, and maybe what you love doesn't even exist yet. And it won't exist for another 10 years. Until maybe you, you build it. Until you, it. Right. Yes. So instead of trying to do what you love when you're young, Go experience as many things as you can and just do the opposite. Just don't do things that you hate. Anything that you're like, okay, this isn't me. I'm, I'm clearly not a numbers guy. I don't want to be a coder. Okay, check that off the list. Now your field of options keeps narrowing and everything else is fair game. And if you do that, if you just don't do things that are monotonous and boring and life sucking, everything else is fair game. And pretty soon you'll end up in some unique sweet spot of something that you really love. Yeah, let's keep going down this train of thought because- I feel that the idea of telling children or even young people in middle school or high school or college for that matter, find that one thing you're going to love and then it's going to not be like work. It's going to be like pleasure for you that you get to do what you love and get paid. But people don't do that. And I wonder if it's because they're, I mean, but people don't go out and explore like you're saying. They, they do think I need to find this one thing. And I wonder if that's a derivative of the fear of failure that is put into kids during their public schooling. Because if you if you get that test back and it has an F on it, you feel like shit. You're like, what <laughs> is wrong with me? Right. The fear of failure. And I remember this because, you know, I, I was a top tier student in school and I I tried to make A's on everything I could. And whenever I would get a B or a C for crying out loud, a C back, you know, I'd really feel like I was failing. But the opposite is true in the marketplace. Like like you said, you have to go out there and you have to try all this stuff and you have to fail. If you're not going to fail, you're never going to succeed. But I feel that we are, and we we learn this fear of failure in the uh, the current conveyor belt school system. Mm. Yeah, you know it's funny the difference in the marketplace. If your startup fails, you don't fail as a person. Right. In fact, you probably had a fun time while it lasted. You probably learned a ton of stuff. And if you're like most entrepreneurs, you're going to have three or four or five of those before you have a success. And we don't say, "Oh, that guy's a failed entrepreneur. He failed five out of six tries." But if you're a student and you fail five out of six classes, we call you a failed student. Uh, it's this zero sum mentality. And, and I think it also the the sort of the stress to pick one thing. It's it's the early careerification of interests or forcing kids on a track and telling someone to pick what you love when they're at an age where they literally only know of like six categories of job. It's like, yeah, oh, there's period. like policeman, fireman, <laughs> right. space you know, astronaut, yeah, <laughs> astronaut, politician. and then like businessman, you know, yeah. guy that wears a suit. Right, right. Businessman, just that yeah. big, vague businessman. Right. That's right. Like doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, whatever, you know, yeah. you got to pick. And so often kids do because they're like, okay, I like, I, I actually just wrote an article about this, about uh, people who are good arguers. They're always told to become lawyers because the only thing that they know about, may, maybe they should be philosophers or entrepreneurs. Maybe they just love to seek the truth, but everyone's so quick to say, oh, you argue well, therefore become a lawyer. So you commit to that at age 15, 16, 17. By the time you're 23 and you're in law school and you hate it, you're pot committed. You, you feel like you're shackled to your past expectations because if you change, everyone from your past will say, but you always dreamed of being a lawyer. You're giving up on your dreams. You're a failure. So you feel obligated right. to, to basically be enslaved to who you used to want to be when you were too ignorant to know any better. And it's, right. it's really, it's really tra uh, tragic.
It is tragic because who knows what they really want to be at 16 years old or 14 years old. I mean, come on. You don't have really any experience outside of your extremely small circle. Well, now maybe you do because we've got Internet. I, it sounds like we're about the same age. Whenever we were growing up, we really didn't have you know, our, no. worlds, our worlds were very small. But now there's there, there's no real excuse for this. You know, no, I mean, I'm, I'm a failure, according to my own definition, because I wanted to be uh, – a fighter pilot. And then I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Um, and then I wanted to be a politician yep. and I've completely and utterly failed at all those things. And boy, am I glad. <laughs> yeah, l- likewise, I wanted to be an astronaut failed. I'm a, you know, I, I worked as an engineer for 10 years and then dropped out. So I guess I'm an engineering dropout. And, and now, you know, I have a podcast and we'll see where this thing goes. Um, so if people are interested in, in Praxis, in discoverpraxis.com, what do you recommend they do? How can they contact you or, or what's the best way to get started? Yeah, I'm actually going to, I'm going to tell your listeners, I'm, I'm going to offer a, a free ebook. Um, it's called The Future of School. And if you go to thefutureofschool.com, you can get this ebook for free. And it's, it's a real short, short little ebook that is essentially my kind of philosophy on education and on career discovery. And it's really sort of the ideas behind Praxis and what, what kind of led to it and what it's all about. And I think that's a great resource if you're interested in this philosophy. And if you're specifically interested in the program right now, absolutely go to discoverpraxis.com. You can email me, Isaac, at discoverpraxis.com anytime. I'd be happy to, to answer your questions, chat with you. But um, definitely go download The Future of School, thefutureofschool.com, super easy. And just give us an idea of what type of person do you think works well for Discover Praxis? I call it the sleep in your car test. Right. <laughs> I think I think there are two kinds of people. You yeah, always love these two kinds of people uh, <laughs> dichotomies, by the way. But there are those who are willing to sleep in their car to get what they want or discover what they want. And there are those who just aren't. They're just kind of like, eh, it sounds kind of hard. And though we don't literally make you sleep in your car, that kind of forward tilt, that drive and work ethic, that's really what we're looking for. So it tends to be sort of 18 to 25 year olds, some people right out of high school, some people bored in college, some people graduated and still feel like they don't have anything to show for it. In that age range, the people who are, yeah, they can they can succeed in the classroom if they have to. They can kind of succeed in whatever environment they're in if they need to, but they're always restless and they're just like, this is too slow. This is boring. I, they're, they're the kind that are probably running some side hustle in middle school, you know, selling right. potato chips on the playground or whatever. They're, they're, they're grinders. They're, they're always working and hustling and they're just restless and bored and they want to engage the world now. They don't want to wait for years and permission slips to be handed supposedly good jobs. They want to go get that experience now and grab on, take life by the horn. So that's that's really it. I mean, that's a very broad thing, but that kind of raw drive, any sort of level of skills and, and talent can usually be worked with, but that kind of work ethic, you either have it or you don't. Yeah, that's that sounds like the type of work ethic required to be an entrepreneur in general. Just yes. that, that sleepless type of dedication that you see something out in the world that you want changed and you think that you have the skills, the time, the talent, the ability, the network, the resources to change it. And you just need a little bit of mentorship. That sounds like the, the right type of person to join you know, discoverpraxis.com as a student. Uh, Isaac, I absolutely love what you're doing here. I've, I was excited to interview you for a long time now. Um, a big thanks to our mutual friend, Gabe, for the introduction. I really appreciate that, Gabe. I know you're listening. And Isaac, is there any last contact information or words of advice or just anything really that you'd like to tell our listeners before we go? No, I would just say life is too short to do things that you hate. And uh, if it's not resonating with you, if it's making you feel dead or dull, just quit. Awesome, Isaac. We'll include the link to your ebook in the show notes, a link to your Discover Praxis. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure. Hey, likewise, Ash. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Doesn't Discover Praxis sound like an amazing experience? If you would like to learn more about Discover Praxis, please feel free to contact Isaac directly using the contact information on our blog post. And mention that you heard about Discover Praxis from Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast because I believe that our affiliation with them will give you a discount through their program. 
Uh, you're welcome to contact me about Discover Praxis as well, and I can forward your information over to Isaac. Come again next week for another exciting interview at Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. And again, thank you so much.